Good morning, everyone. This is Amar Rangaswamy, the founder of Indiaspora. Welcome to the fourth annual virtual Indiaspora Climate Summit. Uh, we, as usual, have broken this into two segments. This is the Western Hemisphere, so I want to wish everyone a good morning, a good afternoon, and some of you uh, a good evening as well. And this is, like I said, the fourth annual summit that we've had uh, virtually. Again, this is a very important issue for us, both personally, having started a forum called the Corporate Eco Forum 16 years ago to really bring climate action to the forefront of large Fortune 500 companies. And also the Indiaspora community has uh, resonated deeply with uh, the same issue. We've had uh, several climate discussions at Indiaspora as well, including a session at COP28 this past year in Dubai, uh, where we had uh, 200 diaspora come together in Dubai to discuss climate action as well. Now, this uh, has taken even more urgency. Uh, as you know, both here in the US and in India, we've seen extreme climate, both drought and floods, heat and cold. And uh, this is upon us, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And this is an issue that's important to both uh, my generation, but also more importantly to the next generation, our kids, our grandkids, and others who follow us. So if you want to keep in touch with Indiaspora, please go to indiaspora.org and you can subscribe to our newsletter uh, and get our blogs and many other details on our network. Again, we are a nonprofit network of diaspora leaders across the world, including the US, Canada, UK, Singapore, UAE, and Australia, where we have chapters. And we also have an office in India as well. So welcome, we'll get started with our opening keynote. And uh, to do this is my dear friend, Andrew Mayock. Andrew is the Chief Sustainability Officer of the US government. He works for President Biden in the White House and has done a remarkable job with uh, getting climate action within the government itself, including, as he will tell you, a lot of uh, projects on electrification, green buildings, and much, much more, really setting the stage for all of us to follow what he and the government are doing uh, their part in, in the whole climate space. Uh, Andrew, uh, before he was uh, in the Biden administration, has been in the Obama administration, he's been in the Clinton administration, he's a lot of public service uh, experience as well as private service, having started his career uh, a while ago at McKinsey and Company as well. So Andrew, uh, please welcome uh, and please have your opening remarks and then we'll do a little bit of Q&A with you. Welcome. Great, thank you, MR. Um, thank you for your leadership and thanks for the whole team at NDS for, for bringing us together today. Um, I wanna thank you, MR, for for not only your leadership from the Indian community, but as you pointed out, sustainability too. I've had the opportunity to um, participate uh, and gain the benefits of bringing the corporate community together with the public sector, in my case, um, to do this urgent work that we're doing today and to have the opportunity to join the Indian community today as um, an extraordinary bonus. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, you know, we have no better friend in the White House than 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 you, Mr. And we really appreciate your your partnership through and through. Um, want to thank all the audience members that are joining us today from across the different time zones, as was just mentioned. Um, you know, I think that goes to the participation across um, uh, these many regions goes to the essence of what we're doing today. They're an urgent climate conversation for this urgent time. So. I'm humbled to join you today and have a conversation with you today about the collective work that we're involved in. I'm also humbled by the opportunity to work with so many from the Indian community in the White House. You know, first and foremost, of course, the Vice President of the United States, uh, in addition to so many other colleagues like Domestic Policy Council's Neera Tandon, Gautam Raghavan, who um, is lead for the president on personnel, speechwriter Vinay Reddy, NSC's Tarun Chabra, and so, so many other colleagues. And in addition to those names who I think a lot of people here might know, I just like to cite a few people um, who I'd call unsung heroes on my immediate team from the Indian community who are the folks who are actually delivering on the work that I get to share with you today. And that includes people like Tanuj Diora and Rishi Garg and Ramiya Tella and Hethel Jane, 
Um, that's just a few of the folks on our media team who represent this community and are doing this really critical work. I want to give them a shout out as well. For our conversation today, and as you think about the, and talk about the work that we're involved in over the course of the day, um, I wanted to you know, set the context, building on what MR just mentioned about, the, well, number one, this moment of urgency, and this also moment of opportunity. And number two is this in President Biden's uh, words and common phrasing, be the decade of action. I want to spend a few minutes on that and how we're delivering, picking up on what MR shared about that too. And then third, to talk about our collective work, how we can work together, how we can make this the moment of action uh, and real and um, uh, you know, outsized outcomes that we need for this day. So first a couple words about this urgent moment. Probably be not does not need to be said to this community, but um, uh, but just lifting up and recognizing what's happening as MR also noted, this urgent time that we're in, this record setting time. And that, you know, we live in a time where day after day we see record breaking heat, record breaking drought, record breaking pre precipitation, record record breaking floods, and record breaking damage. Um, and, you know, one can um, look no further than a, a region next to you or a country next to you to see the really profound effects of climate. And as President Biden says, the clear and urgent danger that climate impacts provide now. Um, so, you know, where it was more, I think, for some of us, an academic question as to whether is climate change real? Is it affecting us? Um, it is, you know, clearly here today, and and the effects of it are built in. So um, that moment of action couldn't be more urgent. And it's also, as President Biden says, and a time of enormous economic opportunity. Uh, it is clear clear to the threat that I just mentioned, but but the incredible gener once in a generation economic opportunity that this is, and that was, you know, a policy idea and a policy proposal in the first year of the Biden administration and a reality that we're seeing and experiencing live today and over the past two years as the Inflation Reduction Act, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the enormous leadership without government support from private sector all across the United States and across the world has you know, shown us that this opportunity is not just uh, a slogan, but it is reality as factory after factory for batteries, for EVs, for for um, um, wind and solar are created throughout the country and throughout the world to deliver on this moment provides enormous economic opportunity. So I think from the urgency of the moment and the opportunity of the moment that we're in, it couldn't be more clear. And for today and the today's discussion, how to build on that work and how to expand and accelerate that work is the real question. And so when the president turned, when the president came into office in the first couple of days, he turned to us in government, the whole of government, and said, we need to move out in unison with force to tackle climate change. He looked at every department in the United States government, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and gave us ambitious goals to go execute on. He turned to my office and said to us, um, in a few words, go electrify our vehicles, electrify our buildings and power them on clean energy and go revitalize sustainability writ large um, and move out fast. I'd like to see that report on my desk within 90 days. Um, and what we then did was go provide that uh, report for the president in which he turned into an exec executive order in which he made very clear targets for us. Like, let's make sure that all light duty vehicles in the US government are zero emission vehicles and our purchase of them no later than the year 2027. So it will be 100% by 2027. Let's do that for medium and heavy duty vehicles no later than 2035. Um, and let's start climbing up that incline now, get to work and going to do that. And so between that and electrify our buildings and power them on clean energy, we as a federal government have been hard at work. And I'm happy to report today in a time where you know, there are a lot of pledges out there, public sector and private sector, and in some cases, not a lot of action. In some cases, 
institutions really struggling with. How do I go deliver on this moment? Proud to say that the Biden administration is delivering on these pledges have become action in really significant ways. And I'll share just a couple of quick examples. You know, one of those examples is um, you know, we're uh, two years into the formalization of the president's sustainability plan, and we have 80,000 zero emission vehicles either in our inventory or on the way. We have 30,000 charging ports to power those vehicles either in our inventory or on the way. You know, that is on par with any other corporate leader on this front. I think of Amazon often when I think of this and their 100,000 vehicle pledge for which they're 10,000 in. Great progress, great goal, really important. And the U.S. government is, you know, right there in the lead. Um, when it comes to our power and moving to clean energy, you know, we start basically at a base of 40% of clean energy and uh, that's powering the U.S. government facilities and vehicles right now. We now have in a pipeline 20%, 20 new percentage points of clean power coming online over the next couple of years on our way to making sure that's 100% no later than 2030. And we've been able to achieve things like the first ever 100% 24-7 carbon-free electricity tariff in the state of Arkansas, for which are now powering USG facilities. Um, and then when it comes to our buildings, we are moved out and forced to go electrify our over 300,000 buildings that we have in our portfolio. And one great example of that is the largest building in the District of Columbia. I used to think it was the largest federal building in the District of Columbia, for which there are many, many federal buildings, which is the Ronald Reagan building. And recently found out it is actually the largest building in the District of Columbia, including larger than the Capitol, of course, and larger than the Washington Convention Center. And that building, the Ronald Reagan building, we announced with John Podesta, with my boss, Brenda Mallory, that it would, would be all, all electric, thanks in part to the IRA. And then we moved out and forth with buildings across the, the United States, doing the same thing, and not only making them electric, but innovating to make sure that they're, in some cases, when we're building on this, grid interactive. So we can work flexibly with the grid when it comes to our assets. So those right one last thing I would cite from an action perspective is that we've also moved out in force thanks to the Infl Inflation Reduction Act on a program that the president calls Buy Clean, which is how do we catalyze markets for low embodied carbon materials like steel, cement, glass, asphalt. Um, really difficult to abate sectors. And moving in on the demand side where the president just announced billions of dollars going to the makers of those products last week in a big DOE announcement. And then on the demand side here, federal government going out and purchasing those products. We have $4.5 billion that we're going out to purchase right now, live, um, low embodied cement, steel, et cetera. Um, so manifest action in a time where it is deeply necessary. Um, and we're seeking to build on that and accelerate, like I said. And this takes us to my final point about collective action and the group of us here today. What can we do? How do I work with the federal government? What's my role? I just wanted to say a quick word about that. Is that, you know, I think we've got a we're we're in a time where um, there are two um, vectors for our partnership. One is I have been the beneficiary, thanks to MR in part, and many others, and and that the federal government has come to this game late, where folks like Google, Amazon, GM have moved out on their clean electricity goals, and we need to learn. We need to grow. You know, we need to mature our our capability quickly. And our corporate partners have been extremely generous with their time, and with their um, with their lessons that they share with us, so we can go hit our goals. So I think where you've show, showing leadership in that um, in this arena, we'd love to connect with you, hear your stories, um, help utilize that as we work this together. And number two, as the world's largest supply buyer of goods and services at over $650 billion a year, in addition to low embodied concrete, steel, glass, and asphalt, we want to buy clean transition product from you. Um, so we look forward to um, you know, building out that supply base. And um, I think that's the other um, critical vector of opportunity here between partnership and purchasing. With that, I'd say, I hope this helps set the scene. I think this is time a time as President Biden reminds us, a time of enormous 
enormous uh, concern and yet enormous opportunity and work in that opportunity with everyone here and the uh, uh, larger communities is uh, is where we what we need to be doing. So it's I'm grateful to be here today. I look forward to our conversation. Oh, Th thanks again for those opening remarks, Andrew. A couple of questions for you. Uh, I'm an optimist, much like you are, uh, where there's a lot of uh, concern, but there's a lot of opportunity. So on the opportunity side, you said on the vehicle side, 80,000 uh, or so to date, uh, but what is the potential of uh, the number of vehicles overall by 2030 or uh, and the uh, you know amount of uh, square feet of buildings that can be electrified? Give us that opportunity and potential. Yeah, I um, on the on the vehicles front, we have over 640,000 vehicles in the federal fleet. So 80,000 is a very serious number um, and the kind of acceleration that we need. And we have a ways to go. Um, and that's that I think we're going to be at 100,000 plus over um, the next few years as we add to that. Um, and um you know, looking for, I'd like to, I'd like us to be in a place, and I think we can be in a place where we set these goals and we exceed these goals. And vehicles is a, I think a market that's moving quite quickly to our favor, um, where there's a very high probability we might be able to do that. So that's uh, on the vehicle front. On the facility front, um, uh, you know, it's another, and uh, you think about it, um, I had the opportunity to live here in Washington, D.C., and it turns out, not surprisingly, that the federal government and our facilities are not only all around the country, but all around the world. So we've got opportunity in every region of the country on the facility front to, as we go seek to retrofit those buildings, as we seek to build new buildings, um, to be on the front end of that electrification. And per, as I shared with you, you know, we have over 300,000 facilities in our real estate portfolio and we're at the beginning of that. So that opportunity is very um, uh, ripe and expansive. Great. Andrew, I know, uh, you know your time is very precious, but thank you for these remarks and uh, answering these questions. Like I said, uh, we will uh, come back to you uh, frequently to get updates, but uh, really the work you do and the administration's doing is commendable. And we thank you and wish you all the best. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, being able to join you today. Deeply appreciate it, MR. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew.